one chances upon in this music is brought forward to produce the effect of bizarre originality, especially the strangest tonalities, the most unnatural chord positions, and the most preposterous combinations. But it is not worthwhile to engage in a long philippic against this perversity. Had the composer submitted this music to a teacher, the latter, it is to be hoped, would have torn it up and thrown it at his feet. And symbolically, this is what we wish to do. From a review in the music journal, Iris in the Realm of Musical Art, July 12th, 1833. Johannes Brahms' Symphony No. 1 in C minor has been widely acknowledged as a masterpiece since its successful premiere in November of 1876, its lofty status appearing to belie the almost 22 years of struggle required to complete it. And yet a closer examination of this long trial tells us a great deal about Brahms, his art, and the cultural milieu in which he came of age as a professional musician. He'd first come to the attention of the musical world in 1853, when Robert Schumann publicly hailed Brahms as the Chosen One, whose compositional talents would give voice to the highest expression of our time and yield orchestral works that would offer even more wonderful glimpses of the spirit world. And yet Schumann's stereotypically dreamy, romantic, egoistic worldview doubtlessly prevented him from realizing what a burden he'd placed on the 20-year-old musician's shoulders. By the middle of the 19th century, the structure of the musical profession in Europe had undergone a fundamental change. Until the previous century's final decades, employment for musicians was primarily found within the context of the church or the nobility. Professional success was achieved by satisfying individual prelates, sovereigns, and aristocrats. But the values of reason and science upon which the Enlightenment was based instigated a broader commitment to education and the distribution of civic information to the public, creating a larger, better educated, and more affluent middle class with disposable income to spend on recreation and entertainment. In music, the emergence of this new market inspired three complementary developments, a vast expansion in public concerts, an explosion in music publishing, and the rise of music journalism. In this regard, the experience of Haydn is instructive. A symphony he wrote during the 1760s or 70s, when he was primarily a court composer, would most often be performed once by court musicians in a private royal venue and then put away. In contrast, a Haydn symphony written 20 years later would be published, the composer receiving a publication fee, then reviewed in a newspaper or magazine, hopefully in a manner that would stimulate public interest, and then performed repeatedly in front of large, ticket-buying crowds. These new entrepreneurial opportunities eroded the previous system of patronage, which survived principally in the form of aristocrats commissioning individual works from musicians working on a freelance basis. Composers of art music were thrust into a relationship with the public that was far more interactive, leaving them vulnerable to popular opinion and the ability of music critics to shape it. The creation of a so-called newspaper civilization in the 19th century as a result of the development of high-speed presses and the availability of cheap newsprint provided powerful new platforms from which journalists expounded at length on the value of individual composers and their works in the arts marketplace. Understanding that this arena of discourse could affect their professional aspirations, composers with literary abilities often became participants. Berlioz became the music critic of the Parisian newspaper Journal des Débats, while Schumann co-founded the highly influential new magazine for music, the journal in which he announced his discovery of Brahms, and Wagner advanced his artistic vision in voluminous books, articles, and essays on a wide variety of subjects. The convergence of highly opinionated people incentivized to express themselves in print as vividly as possible stirred the same impulses that inform an internet flame war often resulting in polemical diatribes, personal attacks, and the formation of cliques. Thus, for a highly introverted person such as Brahms, just out of his teens with only a handful of unpublished works to his credit, to be thrown into this professional maelstrom as a result of Schumann's hyperbolic and extremely public endorsement was, at the very least, a mixed blessing. <laughs> Having 
referred to Brahms' Opus 1 and 2 piano sonatas as veiled symphonies, Schumann urged the young composer to jump immediately into symphonic writing. Although Brahms started sketching a work in 1854, he soon developed cold feet, initiating a long period during which he seemed to avoid composing a symphony by writing for orchestra in a variety of other formats. These early sketches were eventually diverted into his first piano concerto, a work he completed in 1858 that was bracketed chronologically by his two orchestral serenades, Opus 11 and 16. During the following decade, Brahms finished what would become the first symphony's opening movement, but he encountered difficulty each time he attempted to go further, and his only completed music for orchestra during those years appeared in his German Requiem. While his ruthless self-criticism was certainly an impediment, he was also pained to have been cast as Beethoven's rightful creative heir by traditionalists seeking to deny the claims of the more radical Wagner, and the gossip and vitriol that played itself out in the print media during this decades-long War of the Romantics became an ongoing source of embarrassment. He also entertained the possibility that his great predecessor, who composed his symphonies during an era when the harmonic conventions that supported the form's structures were still in place, had exhausted the genre's potential. Complaining to his friends, you have no idea how it feels to hear the tramp of a giant like Beethoven behind you. But the enormous success of the Requiem's premiere in 1868 fueled his confidence, and by the 1870s he was making progress with the symphony. He engaged in a final symphonic dry run by orchestrating a work he'd written for two pianos, his variations on a theme by Haydn, which was performed for the first time in November of 1873 by the Vienna Philharmonic to great acclaim. With no more intermediary steps to take, he was finally able to complete his first symphony three years later. In achieving this artistic and personal breakthrough, he'd taken on Beethoven's symphonic inheritance and rendered it with his own distinctive creative voice, producing one of the orchestral literature's most cherished works. (laughs) ¶¶ 